Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. We hope you enjoy this sermon from a recent Sunday worship service. Over the last couple of weeks, I was remembering that four years ago, I was posting pictures of empty shelves at Wegmans as we all looked for toilet paper and fresh fruit. This was because of a once-in-a-century pandemic that mostly everyone was not prepared to happen in the course of our lifetimes. The experience of the pandemic has been so impactful on almost every aspect of our lives. In the very worst of the pandemic zones, people were just trying to survive, as so many people try to do when there isn't a pandemic. Survival is tied into many factors, financial, social location, cultural, geographical, historical. Such a wide array of factors can impact the level of needs when it comes to survival. I've been reflecting, as many of us have, on what it means to survive as it relates to our democracy and the world as we have known it. I, like so many others, uh, I'm worried about it regardless of the outcome of any trials or any Supreme Court decision or any election, I'm worried about how we're going to survive all the mess that we're in, let alone thrive. With all these thoughts I've been having lately, I've begun to really pine for a profile in courage. Someone who rises to the ranks of a statesperson, or more specifically, someone who can rise above the petty politics of the day and really promote an idealistic and yet realistic understanding of the common core of who we as humans, as communities of Americans are. In today's world, I am not sure how that would happen and from where this person might arise. But it has happened before, and I certainly want to believe that it could absolutely happen again. So in reflecting on this, I always kind of end up in the same place because of my age and my experience in the world. I start to think of the life story of Robert F. Kennedy. Not Junior, who is now running for president, but his father, the brother of President Kennedy. For years, Bobby Kennedy was an enforcer and a bully who worked with his brother to further their political goals. He was someone who worked the system to get what they wanted and by most accounts wasn't a very nice person. And then something happened. In an article written by author and activist Kevin Powell titled, Appreciating Bobby Kennedy's Stunning Transformation, In the aftermath of his brother's tragic death, RFK became a fearless champion for the underrepresented. That's the title of the article. Powell writes, But then a singular event changed that forever. President John F. Kennedy was gunned down in broad daylight. A vast nation had its love affair with Camelot abruptly dashed and Bobby lost his best friend, his big brother, and his political twin, and his political shield. I can only imagine that he descended into an emotional darkness that felt perhaps like the way the poor Irish people must have felt during the potato famine, or the darkness Native Americans felt when Europeans stole their land, stomped their culture, and massacred their people, or perhaps the deep darkness Africans felt when they were kidnapped from their motherland stuffed into ships like cargo and brought to a strange new place as slaves. To be the victims of a very ugly and peculiar kind of skin hatred, racism. It was a hatred that became the very reason why they had finally gotten up the collective courage in those very tumultuous 1960s to fight for freedom and equality. Then Powell observes, yes, In that unending sadness Bobby Kennedy felt upon the death of his brother, in that deep depression that shrouded him with loneliness and fear and hesitation, we know now that he understood in his bones that he had to emerge a different man, 
a changed man, a man of the people. And when Bobby showed up in public again for the first time in the late summer of 1964 at the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, there was a thunderous and sustaining standing ovation for him for who he was, for what the country had lost. And Bobby looked scared, overwhelmed, and uncomfortable. And I would read that behind the big podium, he was shaking as he spoke. He had been there, been the one behind the scenes, the operator, the manipulator. And now here he stood himself, naked before the world, vulnerable, unsure of who he was and what to do next. He wasn't sure of what to do next. But what he did was he listened and experienced the fears and the hopes so deeply embedded in who we are as a people and as a nation. He reflected deeply on his life post the assassination of his brother, and it changed him. As Kevin Powell continues, somewhere around the mid-1990s, I began making speeches across America and globally, too, and found myself looking for inspiration to other speakers. And one of the very first speeches of Bobby Kennedy's that I checked out was his famous one, The Night That Dr. King Was Killed. Bobby was in Indianapolis uh, on April 14, 1968. By this time, a United States senator from New York and initially reluctant presidential candidate. And Reynolds says, he had been warned that black folks in Indy were going to rebel, that things could become violent and explode as they would in other American cities because of Martin Luther King's murder. But RFK ignored the warnings and the fear mongers. And here were some of his words on that night. For those of you who are black and are tempted to be filled with hatred and distrust at the injustice of such an act against all white people, I can only say, that I feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States, we have to make an effort to understand, to go beyond these rather difficult times. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or they be black. The vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together, want to improve the quality of our life and want justice for all human beings who abide in our land. And then he said, let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle this life of this world. So today, maybe we're looking for the same kind of inspiration, the reluctant presidential candidate who spoke so eloquently, spoke to his hope, the hope of not only surviving, but what it would be like for all of us to thrive. What we need now in the United States is not division or hatred, not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion towards one another and a feeling of justice towards those who still suffer in this country. So too, I have looked for voices of hope. Voices that speak to the motivation to help us not just survive, but to find ways to thrive together as only a just and compassionate society can. And one of the voices of inspiration that I have looked to is echo feminist philosopher and activist Joanna Macy. And she talks about an active kind of hope, a hope for a thriving world with a caveat when she says, Active hope is not wishful thinking. Active hope is not waiting to be rescued by some savior. Active hope is waking up to the beauty of life on whose behalf we can act. We belong to this world. 
The web of life is calling us forth at this time, and we've come a long way and are here to play our part. <clears throat> With Act of Hope, we realize that there are adventures in store, strengths to discover, and comrades to link arms with. Act of hope is a readiness to discover the strengths in ourselves and in others. A readiness to discover the reasons for hope and the occasions for love. A readiness to discover the size and strength of our hearts, our quickness of mind, our steadiness of purpose, our own authority, our love of life, the liveliness of our curiosity, the unsuspected depth of our patience and diligence, the keenness of our senses, and our capacity to lead. None of these can be discovered in an armchair or without risk. I have to admit, I truly wish there was a person that we all would rise to follow, whose goodness, kindness, vision, and hope was so clear and so undeniable in these turbulent times that we would set a course with them for a better world. But there isn't. And maybe there actually never is. Maybe the times we have moved from just surviving to a vision of shared thriving is when someone or a bunch of someone reach a point where there is a readiness to discover the strengths in ourselves and in others and a readiness to discover the reasons for hope and the occasions for love. For what it's worth, as much as I wish there was someone beautiful, inspiring, a savior coming to lead us to all new era of love and cooperation, what I see when I look around isn't one Savior, but caring people, tired people, some overworked, some overwrought, some brimming with what's possible and others burned out from trying to push the boulder up the hill. But here's what I also see, beautiful and inspiring ready to do what they can to make this world a more loving, more just, kinder, and more compassionate place. And we need to find our personal and collective inspiration where we use it to bring an act of hope into this world. These are difficult days. But let us not give up on hope. We clearly need each other to keep it alive in us all. So again, let us rededicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of humanity and make gentle this life in this world. Amen, and may that be so. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. To listen to more sermon podcasts, go to uucf.org slash worship hyphen services and scroll down to sermon podcasts.